The Taiping Rebellion, 1850 to 1864, was a grand civil war mainly in southern China, led by the charismatic Hong Shou Chuan, who envisioned the establishment of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, a state that was based on his claim of being the brother of Jesus Christ. Hong sought to overthrow the ruling Qing dynasty and eradicate Confucianism, Buddhism, and every other Chinese practice that he found contrary to his new rule. The rebellion was characterized by its unprecedented scale and ferocity, resulting in the deaths of over 20 million people, making it one of the deadliest conflicts in history. Welcome to the channel. If you're new here, good to meet you. And if you're coming back, it's good to have you with me again. As always, if you want to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in description and comments. Otherwise, thank you in advance for liking the video, as this helps me have YouTube push it out to a broader audience. Thank you very much. Now, without further ado, let's get on to our topic today. The Taiping Rebellion Throughout the 19th century, the Qing dynasty was beleaguered by an accumulation of crises that precipitated widespread political and social unrest. This period was marked by severe famines, natural disasters, economic troubles, and humiliating defeats by foreign powers. The Qing military's devastating loss in the First Opium War underscored the dynasty's military and economic vulnerabilities, compounded by the rampant illicit opium trade pushed upon them by the British. These factors contributed to a significant trade imbalance that severely destabilized the economy. The backbone of Chinese society, the agrarian sector, faced dire straits as farmers grappled with exorbitant taxation and skyrocketing rents, leading to mass desertions of farmland. Meanwhile, banditry flourished as a symptom of the prevailing social disarray. If you can't make an honest living, you may as well go and make a dishonest one. While the formation of numerous secret societies and self-defense units signaled the growing militarization of the dissatisfied civilian populace, exacerbated by the frequency of localized conflicts, and there were plenty of them. Amidst these upheavals, China's population saw a dramatic increase, nearly doubling from 1766 to 1833, without a corresponding expansion in arable land. This demographic pressure strained the already precarious economic and social structures. Governance under the Qing, dominated by the ethnic Manchu minority, was perceived as increasingly corrupt and equally ineffective, particularly in the southern regions where the government's authority was diluted by powerful local warlords and clans. This environment of heightened ethnic tensions, anti-Manchu sentiments, found fertile ground, especially among the Hakka people. In Chinese called Kejia, a Han Chinese subgroup mainly near Guangdong province and Guangxi. This period also saw the active proselytization, proselytization, pardon me, I always have trouble with that word, efforts of Christian ministries, introducing new religious ideologies 
into the complex tapestry of Chinese spiritual life. The ferment of the time found a pivotal figure in a man named Hong Huo Xu, a Hakka from Guangdong. Repeated failures to secure a position through the imperial examination system, a pathway to civil service and scholarly honor, culminated in a personal crisis for Hong in 1837. His third failure precipitated a nervous breakdown, during which he was taken ill and brought into several different fever dreams and during these dreams he experienced visions of celestial realms. In one of these visions, he encountered divine beings who revealed to him a heavenly destiny that contrasted starkly with his mundane earthly existence. Hong's divine revelations led him to adopt the name Hong Xiu Quan, a significant departure from his given name Hong Huo Xu, in compliance, of course, with the celestial instructions. So, what did he see in this dream? Well, it was perhaps influenced by events of previous times. You see, his interpretive lens for these visions being visited by divine figures, was significantly influenced by his subsequent engagement with Christian literature, which he had initially encountered but disregarded years before. Revisiting these texts in the wake of his cousin's visit, and after another failed examination attempt in 1843, Hong found a theological framework that resonated with his dreamlike encounters. He identified the figures coming towards him as Jesus and Confucius, and especially he identified the Christian God as his celestial father and Jesus Christ as his brother, perceiving his divine mission to purge the world of what he called demonic forces, embodied by the Qing regime and Confucian orthodoxy. In a pursuit of deeper understanding of Christian doctrine, Hong travelled to the port city of Guangzhou in 1847 to study the Bible under Isaacar Jacos Roberts an American Baptist missionary. However, Robert's refusal to baptize Hong, citing the latter's politicization of religious further, highlighted a complex situation between Hong's spiritual revelations and the burgeoning political movement that would come to challenge the ruling class. Regardless, it was in this period that the groundwork was laid for the real Taiping Rebellion, a cataclysmic civil war that resulted in widespread destruction. In 1844, before the events in Guangzhou, and following Hong Xiuquan's commencement of his preaching journey through Guangxi, his disciple Feng Yun Shan established the God Worshipping Society. This creatively named movement was rooted in Hong's unique theological blend that amalgamated Christianity with elements of Taoism, Confucianism, and local millenarian beliefs, suggesting it as a revival of the ancient Chinese veneration of Shangdi. Of course, the Europeans have a word for this. It's called heresy. But they didn't know much about this at the time, but they'd find out. This synthesis of religious tradition evolved into what some scholars have termed 
Taiping Christianity, and it marks a significant departure from the traditional Chinese religious practices, and forming of a new, dynamic, and exciting Chinese religion. Initially, the growth of the Taiping movement was characterized by its confrontations with and suppression of bandit and pirate groups plaguing southern China in the late 1840s. However, as the Qing authorities began to clamp down on the movement, the god-worshippers were compelled to adapt their tactics, transitioning from direct confrontations to guerrilla warfare. This shift heralded the beginning of an escalation that would eventually culminate in a full-blown civil war. Now, amidst the burgeoning insurgency, two prominent figures within the God-worshipping society, Yang Xiuqing and Xiao Chao Gui, asserted that they, like Hong, were also divine messengers from the celestial family. That's convenient. Yang claimed to speak with the authority of the Heavenly Father, while Xiao purported to convey the words of Jesus Christ himself. Interesting. It's always the people in power who can hear it, right? Well, not always, but you know what I mean. It's a bit sus. Now, in Guangxi province, things were beginning to ignite, and the God-worshipping society had started to face some aggressive religious persecution by the local Qing officials. In the early January of 1851, catalyzed by a skirmish in late December 1850, a formidable rebel force of approximately 10,000, marshaled by Feng Yunshan and Wei Cheng Hui, achieved a significant victory over Qing troops in Jintian, today known as the town of Guiping. This early success for the Taiping forces was further bolstered when they managed to thwart a retaliatory attack led by the Standard Green Army aiming to quell the Jindian uprising. On January the 11th, 1151, marking a pivotal moment in the insurrection, Hong Xiaochuan proclaimed himself the Heavenly King of a new sovereign state, the Heavenly Kingdom of Peace, or the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, giving rise to the term Taipings in English historiography. In a strategic maneuver to evade the encroaching Qing forces, the Taiping army embarked on a northward march in September of 1851, charting a course through Hunan along the Xiang River. This campaign saw the Taipings laying siege to Changsha, seizing Yuezhou, and by December 1852, capturing Wuchang upon reaching the Yangtze River. This conquest of Wuchang prompted the Taiping leadership to pivot eastward, following the Yangtze River, culminating in the capture of Anjing in February of 1853. The rebellion's ascendancy possibly involved overtures to the triads, believe it or not. This widespread secret society, with a significant presence in southern China, and infiltrations within the government's military ranks. The parallels between the Taiping and triad titles, intentional or otherwise, potentially enhanced the rebellion's appeal to triad members, facilitating their integration into the Taiping ranks. 
In 1852, amidst these developments, Qing forces apprehended Hong Da Chuan, a rebel leader who claimed the title of Tian Tu Wang, King of Heavenly Virtue. All the titles sound so cool, don't they? Well, he was allegedly sharing co-sovereignty with Hong Xiu Chuan in the Heavenly Kingdom, so he was certainly a big target. His capture and subsequent confession, while possibly reflecting the influence of the distinct but similarly anti-Qing White Lotus Rebellion, underscored more of the complexity of the time. You must remember that the Qing, pretty much the more time they were in power, the less popular they became. Full video on the fall of the Qing later on, which was more of a whimper rather than going out with a bang. But back to the topic at hand. On March 19th, 1853, a significant turning point in the Taiping Rebellion occurred with the capture of Nanjing by Taiping forces, an event that led Hong Xiu Chuan to proclaim it the heavenly capital of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. In a drastic demonstration of their animosity toward the Manchus, whom they deemed demonic, the Taipings executed all Manchu men within the city, and subjected the Manchu women to a horrific death, burning them alive outside of the city limits. Of course, this act of violence certainly put a lot of people on edge, and no one really wanted to be burned to death or anything like that, so maybe it was just best to, uh, do what the Taiping tell us to do. Well, in the same year, the Taiping leadership embarked on an ambitious northern and western expedition. These military campaigns were intended to expand their territorial control and alleviate the mounting military pressures on Nanjing. While the northern expedition ended up in failure, the Western Expedition saw some degree of success, albeit limited success. Now during this period, Hong Xiu Chen began to somewhat distance himself from the day-to-day -day governance and military strategy, preferring to rule through proclamations, a little bit of a hands-off approach. He led a life of seclusion, but certainly one of luxury, surrounded by reportedly quite a great many concubines while issuing religious edicts. This retreat from active leadership led to friction with Yang Xiu Qing, whose questioning of Hong's policies, extensive espionage network, and self-proclaimed divine authority became sources of deep mistrust. The escalating tensions between Hong and Yang culminated in the 1856 Tianjin Incident, during which Yang and his followers were massacred on Hong's orders by Wei Changhui and Qin Zhi Gang revealing deep rifts within the upper levels of the Taiping's leadership. The immediate aftermath of the Tianjin incident saw further violence, with Wei and Qin turning against Shi Da Kai, another prominent Taiping leader, which led to the death of his family and his followers. Although Wei and Qin initially planned to seize Hong himself, their plot was discovered, and they were executed. Shi Dakai granted command of consolidated Taiping forces 
chose to leave Nanjing for the west, signaling more deep divisions within the Taiping hierarchy. With Hong Xiuquan increasingly isolated, and the death of key leaders like Yang Xiaoqing, the Taiping leadership attempted, unsuccessfully, to garner broader public support and establish alliances with European powers, who remained officially neutral despite some Europeans serving as military advisors to the Qing forces. There were, however, some European observers who originally thought it would be great to have a Christian ruler in China. That would certainly serve our interest. Well, Hong Xiaochuan is not really the kind of quote-unquote Christian ruler that you really want. Either way, the rebellion faced significant opposition within China, particularly from traditionalist rural communities and, of course, the landowning gentry who were alienated by the Taiping's radical social policies and their challenge to Confucian values. The Qing dynasty's counter-offensive was spearheaded by the Xiang army, led by Zhong Guofan, which proved effective in reclaiming territories from the Taiping. By late 1856, Qing forces had recaptured Wuchang, and subsequent campaigns saw the gradual retaking of Hubei and Jiangxi provinces, which are huge areas of land. To think that the Taiping controlled that much area is its quite impressive. Well, in a late boost to the Taiping cause, Hong Ren Gan, Hong Xiaochuan's cousin, joined the rebellion in 1859, bringing with him plans for the expansion of the Taiping territory. It all looked pretty good on paper. And by 1860, the Taiping had scored significant victories, capturing key cities in southern Jiangsu and Zhejiang, China's wealthiest regions. Zhejiang is pretty much where Shanghai is, although Shanghai effectively runs as its own economic zone nowadays. But nonetheless, Zhejiang and Jiangsu, which I believe Suzhou is in, have always been extremely wealthy cities, regions rather. The Taiping Rebellion's final chapters were marked by intense military engagements and strategic maneuvers, as the Qing dynasty sought to quell the insurrection once and for all. The Taiping attempt to seize Shanghai in June of 1861, a critical commercial hub, was a bold move that ultimately culminated in failure after a prolonged 15-month resistance. And this is back when Shanghai had their own city wall, by the way, much easier to defend. The defense of Shanghai was notably spearheaded by Frederick Townsend Ward's force, which later evolved into the ever-victorious army under the command of Charles George Gordon. This unit comprised of Qing troops, augmented by European tactical expertise, and played a pivotal role in countering the relentless typing advances, earning its moniker through consistent battlefield success. The death of the Xianfeng Emperor in 1861, and subsequent rise of the Tongzhi Emperor, coincided with significant Qing military achievements, including the capture of An Qing, aided by a Royal Navy blockade, which always helps to have the Royal Navy on your side, that's for sure. The victory was part of a broader Qing counter-offensive, 
that saw recaptures and strategic wins against the Taiping, including that repulsion of that assault on Shanghai, but also the retaking of Ningbo, another coastal city, and other key locations along the Yangtze River corridor. The Qing reconquest was characterized by a strategic overhaul, spearheaded by generals such as Li Hongzhang, Zuo Zongtang, and Zheng Guofan, who reorganized the Qing forces into a more formidable military apparatus. Drawing inspiration from Ming dynasty military strategies, these leaders recruited and meticulously trained local militias, fostering a sense of personal loyalty and improving operational efficiency. Their efforts gradually restored Qing authorities across the rebellion-torn regions. Amidst these developments, the Taiping mounted a final eastern expedition, managing to capture Ningbo and Hangzhou. Yet their siege of Shanghai was always a bad memory, and it affected morale in subsequent engagements. The ever-victorious army's contributions were of course instrumental, and they would come back in further engagements too. At this point, the balance of power had effectively shifted in the Qing dynasty's favor, and the Taiping were starting to get a little nervous. Therefore, the Taiping leadership faced mounting challenges, including the surrender and subsequent execution of key commander Shi Da Kai. The beleaguered state of the Taiping forces was further compounded by the internal strife and loss of strategic territories, more and more of them slowly dripping away. By June 1864, the death of Hong Shou Chuan, reportedly from food poisoning amid the siege of Nanjing, signaled the imminent collapse of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. His successor, Hong Tiangui Fu, was unable to stem this tide of defeat, leading to the fall of Nanjing and the subsequent capture and execution of what remained of the Taiping leadership. Despite the fall of Nanjing and the decimation of the Taiping leaders, Remnants of the Taiping forces continued to resist in northern Zhejiang, rallying around Hong Tiangui Fu until his capture in October 1864. The residual resistance was gradually pushed back, with the final Taiping loyalists being defeated in Guangdong province in January 1866. In the aftermath of the Taiping's rebellion's climactic end in Nanjing did not signify the cessation of hostilities across China, however. Several hundred thousand Taiping soldiers continued their resistance in the border regions, with a significant contingent fighting still in Jiangxi and Fujian. It wasn't until August 1871 that the final Taiping force, which was led by Li Fu Zhong, a commander who was strongly associated with Shi Da Kai, was decisively defeated by Qing government forces in a comprehensive campaign across Hunan, Guizhou, and Guangxi. While the ramifications of the Taiping War extended beyond China's borders, affecting neighboring Vietnam profoundly. In 1860, Wu Ling Yun, an ethnic Zhuang and Taiping leader, declared himself the monarch of a kingdom in the Sino-Vietnamese borderlands. This entity, however, was pretty short-lived, 
meeting its end in a Qing military campaign in 1868. The ensuing chaos saw Wu Lingyun's son fleeing to Vietnam, only to himself be killed in 1869, further destabilizing the region and contributing to the emergence of marauding groups like the Yellow Flag and the Black Flag armies. The latter, under Liu Yongfu, played a significant role in later conflicts, including opposition to French colonial ambitions in the Sino-French War, and a brief leadership tenure in the Republic of Formosa. That's Taiwan, by the way. This period also saw the emergence of what is known as flag gangs, which basically devolved into banditry and significantly impacted the remnants of the Lan Shang Kingdom and engaged in conflicts against the forces of King Rama V. The misidentification of these bandits as Chinese Muslims from Yunnan led to the misleading nomenclature of the Hao Wars. Well, moving out of Vietnam, back to China, the devastation that was wrought by the Taiping Rebellion, with death toll estimates ranging widely from 20 to 30 million, underscores the calamitous impact of the conflict on China's population. Exacerbated by plague, famine, and continuous warfare. The contemporaneous Nian Rebellion, along with the Panthe and Dungan revolts, highlight the enduring unrest and opposition to Qing rule, reflecting a mosaic of regional, ethnic, and ideological resistances across China. Collaborations between Tianping Taiping, rather, remnants, and other rebel groups like the Nian rebels, as well as connections between various uprisings across the country, illustrate this widespread dissatisfaction and upheaval that characterize mid-19th century China. Utter carnage and complete chaos. Okay, so let's have a look at the military side of it. What exactly did the Qing have to contend with? What were they up against? Well, the Taiping Rebellion showcased surprisingly innovative military strategies that pushed the Qing towards significant military reforms. Described by some as the most crucial since the 17th century, so you know that the Taiping were certainly utilizing tactics that made the Qing do some serious thinking, especially in their guerrilla tactics, harassing raids on small parties and poisoning wells, this sort of thing. But the rebellion's strength lay in its disciplined and fervent army, recognizable by their red jackets, blue trousers, and notably long hair, earning them the nickname Long Hair in China. But it was different to the normal hairstyle of the Qing, which was a, called a queue. It was a sort of a plait that go behind the ears, whereas the Taiping would wear their hair in a different way to distinguish themselves from Manchu. Initially, the presence of numerous women in the ranks set the Taiping army apart as well, but their numbers began to dwindle after 1853. Battles during the rebellion were just like any other, characterized by intense and brutal combat, primarily fought with small arms rather than artillery, leading to higher casualties, but also very few decisive outcomes. Days and days of killing and dying, without really anything to show for it. 
The Taipings aim to capture and hold major cities. Using them to expand their influence and recruit locally was somewhat effective, but it was mainly due to people being too frightened to say no. Of course, that doesn't mean that quite a lot of people didn't get swept up in the religious fervor, because quite a few of them certainly did. With an estimated two million soldiers, the Taiping's army's structure drew inspiration from historical models, organizing the corps into groups of around 13,000 men each. And besides the main force, there were also allied irregular troops. Despite lacking formal foreign government support, the Taiping acquired modern weaponry from international suppliers, including firearms and artillery, through purchases and smuggling, notably by English and American dealers. They also set up their own factories in Nanjing to produce weapons, and even the Qing had to admit that they were better than the weapons they had possibly because they were getting a little help from the foreigners, who had the habit of keeping the best weapons for themselves and only selling possible enemies, and even allies, somewhat outdated models. Cannons which range would fall short of the newer model. Things like that. Now, advice from the Taiping loyal King Liu Shou Cheng before his execution highlight the importance of adopting and manufacturing foreign artillery for future conflicts. Foreigners involved with the Taiping forces, noted for their bravery, quick defensive constructions, and innovative tactics, like encircling Qing positions with fire. Certainly, it was a good idea to have a few foreigners around, and a lot of them joined up out of that religious fervor. Indeed, the new Christian leader. They had to get behind that, didn't they? But what about off-land? The Taiping Navy, though small, did have a few times where they shone in the conflict notably controlling parts of the Yangtze River, with a fleet of captured boats under commanders like Tang Zhengcai. Now, of course, Hong Shouchuan was a hawker, and yes, that was primarily the ethnic composition of the Taiping army, but there were also Cantonese and Zhuang people, which are, by the way, very different subgroups, especially Zhuang. Nowadays, in places like Guangzhou, the Cantonese and the Hakka are quite intermixed, but Cantonese and Hakka language, well, they are certainly very different. Of course, around southern China, it's quite a complex tapestry of different ethnic groups, and pretty much little sections of all of them joined up with the Taiping. After all, everybody was so annoyed with the Qing rule and having to keep that silly haircut of theirs that they would choose anything just to get out of it. Well, the Taiping was unfortunately not the revolution that they wanted, but it's what they got. While well, Hong Xiaochuan and the other Taiping leaders being Hakka is significant. As the Hakka were often marginalized and settled in less desirable lands due to their late arrival in regions already populated by established Han groups, like the Yue-speaking Cantonese in Guangdong and the Min speakers in Fujian, the Hakka's status as guest households, which is literally what the name means, Ke Jia, guest household, 
and their historical association with rebellion stem from their marginalization and the conflicts that it engendered. Of course, stop pushing around the Harko. No wonder they hit back. Now the Zhuang, China's largest non-Han ethnic minority, were another key component in the Taiping forces. While integrating into Han Chinese culture over the centuries, Zhuang communities faced friction with the Han, occasionally leading to armed uprisings due to uneven assimilation rates and the great many cultural differences. Their integration was facilitated by linguistic diversity of Han culture, even though the Zhuang language itself is quite distinct from Han dialect. Socially, the Taiping Rebellion was largely driven by individuals from lower economic strata, with many southern troops being former miners from the Zhuang areas. The leadership and rank and file of the Taiping army rarely included members of the imperial bureaucracy or landlords. In fact, landlords in territories occupied by the Taiping were often executed immediately. Well, either way, the rebellion was characterized by its approach of total warfare. Nearly every single resident within the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom who hadn't evacuated was recruited and trained for combat against the Qing forces. The Taiping's household registration system mandated the conscription of one adult male from each family member into the military ranks, with no exceptions. The conflicts of course saw both sides engaged in scorched earth tactics, aimed at denying essential resources to the enemy, and that was where a lot of the deaths came from. That 20 million figure has been estimated to be perhaps up to 30 million. Agricultural destruction, along with mass executions in captured cities, and punitive measures against civilian populations were all employed to weaken the opponent's war capability. The extent of civilian involvement in the war effort and the deliberate targeting of non-combatants by both military forces underscore the total war and brutality, the nature of this conflict, leaving vast rural areas completely devastated. The Taiping forces, upon capturing territory, systematically executed the entire Manchu population within those areas. Observations from Qing loyalists in Hunan province reported that Taiping soldiers massacred Manchu men, women and children, often chanting out their little Christian mantras while carrying out these killings in places like Hefei. Notably, the capture of Nanjing by the Taiping resulted in the deaths of approximately 40,000 Manchu civilians. A significant massacre also occurred on October 27, 1853 in Changzhou, where Taiping troops eliminated around 10,000 Manchus after crossing the Yellow River. From the onset of the rebellion in Guangxi, Qing policy was unforgiving, prohibiting any rebel who spoke the dialect from surrendering. Post-rebellion, in Guangdong province, it's reported that the Qing dynasty executed approximately one million individuals in retaliation, targeting the Hakka people with daily killings that reached up to 30,000 at the peak of these actions. This brutal campaign was not just isolated to Guangdong, but it was mirrored in Anhui, Nanjing and other regions, leading to a significant exodus and the destruction of some 600 towns across China. 
the Taiping Rebellion, while leaving behind a legacy of immense human and economic tolls, also instigated significant changes within the late Qing Dynasty's structure and societal dynamics. There was a partial decentralization of power, and ethnic Han officials began to occupy higher ranks in the administration more frequently than before, marking a departure from the Qing Dynasty's traditional reliance on Manchu banner forces. Of course, it was a little bit hard to rely on the Manchu when most of them were dead. I mean, that generally makes it difficult. Well, the rebellion also served as a source of inspiration for future Chinese revolutionaries, including Sun Yat-sen, or Sun Zhongshan, influencing their organizational methods and blending of Christianity with visions of social equality. The influence extended to the early 20th century with Taiping veterans participating in movements like the Revive China Society. While Karl Marx viewed the rebellion primarily through the lens of its violence and destruction, Mao Zedong and subsequent Chinese communist historians framed it as a kind of precursor to a communist revolution underscoring its significance in the evolution of revolutionary thought and strategy. The rebellion's impact was of course deeply felt on the demographic and economic scope, particularly in the Yangtze Delta region, which saw a dramatic population decline due to the famine, disease and the massacres, of course. This led to a labor shortage which subsequently elevated the value of labor. Supply and demand, right? And people began to ask for higher wages. Though I suppose the people who survived, quite reminiscent of the situation after the Black Plague, did capitalize where they could. I suppose you can't blame them. And with that, we are at the end of our video for the Taiping Rebellion and the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom of Hongshou Chuan. I would like to thank my Mega Chad dear patrons, as being Stark Factory, JC, and Jeffrey. Thank you very much. And if you'd like to support the channel on Patreon, you know what to do. Well, until then, I will wish you all the best. Thank you once more for listening. And I will see you in the next video. Good night.